Good morning. My name is Matt. I'm the senior minister here at Greenwood Christian Church, and I want to welcome you today. I'm glad that you're with us today. Whether you're joining us here on campus in person or you're tuned in on our online campus, we're really grateful to be able to connect with you today. I want to make sure that you're aware of a few things as we get our worship experience together started. Uh, when it comes to communion, that's a really important time in our service together. Right now, though, we're trying to minimize the number of things that we all touch. So rather than passing anything down the rows, you'll find some communion elements, some uh, plastic cups you can pick up on your way out after the service. If you're watching from home right now, if you're tuned in online with us, we'd love for you to be a part of that as well. If you have uh, crackers or grape juice or anything of that nature that you could assemble now to be ready for that part of the experience when it gets here, that would be great. Uh, giving is a very important part of ministry for us. You can always do that through our mobile app. You can do that through our website. And if you're here on campus with us, you'll see some baskets on the same tables where you'll find the communion elements after the service. And you can deposit a gift there if you would like to do that. We're so glad that you're with us, not only because we want to share these moments together, but because we want to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And so after our service, we'd love to invite you to take a next step. If that means learning more about our church or about Jesus, if you're ready to follow him, to commit your life to him in baptism, to get connected in ministry or to a life group, there are a number of ways that you can do that. But we would love for you to go to greenwoodchristian.com slash next steps. We'd love to get a little information from you and then we'll follow up with you and help you in any way we can to take those steps. Now, let's worship together. Well, good morning. Would you stand with us and prepare to worship my Lord? Oh 
Fernando Patino. Many of you don't know me, but I would like to share a story with you. I didn't grow up in the church. I thought I was a pretty good person growing up, and I would say most of the people I hung out with thought so as well. But the truth is, I was living a reckless life away from God. In summary, I was chasing after the desires of, the, of this world. However, even though I was far from God, He was always near. Something, I didn't know what it was then, was calling me. I will forever be thankful that Jesus rescued me out of the darkness I was living in. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And aren't you guys glad Jesus came near to us? Let's, let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we can't thank you enough for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our sins. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Paul Cockrum, and whether you are joining us online or here in person, welcome. And once again, the madness is upon us. As promised, we have our results for the first round, which is officially over. We have first, second, and lots of third place people. And of course, uh, if you want to congratulate Tommy over here after service, feel free to do that. Uh, we will continue to give you those results as we go week by week. Uh, and here's the results for this week. It's good. We are also very excited about our upcoming Easter weekend. We're going to have a good Friday service at 7 p.m. I had to remember the time. And then we will have three services, one Saturday at 6 and then two on Sunday at 9.30 and 11. Uh, that will be the first weekend that our valet ministry will reopen uh, again for the first time. So if you have struggled with mobility issues and you've been waiting to come back for whatever reason, uh, that, that opportunity and that service will be available to you. I want to encourage you uh, to come back, enjoy that, and we are looking forward to that weekend. I also want to encourage you to invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite your coworkers. We have a Facebook event. You can share that. We have invitation cards out in the comments and also some yard signs. Uh, grab one of those on your way out. Again, just invite, your, invite the people around you to come enjoy and celebrate our Savior together on Easter weekend. Now let's continue to worship the greatness of our God today.
Well, we hope that you have heard this many times already this morning, uh, but we uh, just want to say welcome uh, to Greenwood Christian Church. We are glad that you are here. My name is Jason, and I'm privileged to serve here on staff at the church. And on the very rare occasion that uh, our senior minister, Matt Giebler, gets a little bit of an opportunity for a break, uh, sometimes you have to put up with me. So I'm sorry about uh, your misery and all of that, but I'm glad we get to spend a little bit of time uh, together today. Now, it's spring break, so maybe some of you are hanging out like on a beach somewhere and streaming us from there. We want to say welcome. Uh, to you. Uh, maybe some are hanging out in their living room here in Greenwood. Some of us are here in person at the Averett campus, but we're glad we get to be together. Well, it was the summer of 2007, all right? I was a much younger man back then, but no less an idiot, okay? So uh, back in those days, I was playing church softball, and uh, in those days, in 2007, I would play church softball in shorts, Nowadays, when I play softball, I play in baseball pants for reasons that will become obvious fairly soon as this story goes along. But anyway, so I'm playing church softball, and I step up to the plate. It's probably around June 2007. Uh, I step up to the plate, and I just smoked a ball. Okay, I hit a ball out to the gap in the outfield, and I have never been fast. Ever, ever, ever. Never been fast, but I'm running quickly for me, okay? And so I go around first, I head around second, and in my baseball career, I've not had a lot of times where I rounded second and people wanted me to continue running, okay? You know, that's just typically not my experience. But as I came around second base, all the guys on my team are going, go, go to third, go to third. So I did, you know, just put my head down, I'm running, I tried to get into third. But if you've ever played baseball, you know what this looks like when everyone's body language that you see in front of you is telling you it's going to be a close play, right? The third baseman is setting up for a throw and, and our, uh, you know, base coach over at third is saying, get down. And so at this point, I think I was 26 years old. 20 years of baseball education and training took over, and I just instinctively hit and slid into third base. Well, I was safe, okay? I was pretty excited. I stood up. Elation just filled my body. I'm pumped. I'm safe at third base. I don't have a lot of triples in the history of my baseball time, so I'm pretty excited. And as soon as I stood up, another feeling took over in my body, just searing pain beginning from my leg and working its way up. And I looked down, and where there should have been a bunch of skin uh, on my calf, there was instead um, no skin and dirt filling in all of the spots where skin should have been, right? So I immediately realized what a tragic mistake that I have made. You know, so I hobble through the rest of that game. We go home, and of course we begin the process of cleaning out the wound, which I think is worse than actually getting the wound. Well, two weeks later, it's time for another church softball game. So what do I do, right? I put on my shorts, and I get ready to head out of the house when Elizabeth catches me, and is like, what are you doing? You can't go play softball? Like, you might re-injure your leg. And guys, help me out. I'm like, don't you tell me my business, woman, right? You know, I'm like, I'm going out to play softball, because what are the odds that I would do the exact same thing in the exact same spot on my body, right? I mean, what are the odds? <laughs> So I go, and I'm proud to report that I hit another really good ball into the outfield two weeks after the last one. And I round first, slower even this time, and around second, head into third. And again, you just lose all understanding of where you are and what's going on, and baseball takes over, and I slid again, this time just tearing my leg to pieces that was trying to heal. Okay, so this time when I went home to clean up my wound, I got far less sympathy from my soulmate um, this time around. Well, anyway, the very next week, we headed out on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, uh, and we went to serve uh, in an area of Santiago in the DR where they call it the hole. Uh, basically, if you can imagine, all of Santiago kind of flows into this low spot, uh, and it's in this area, and so anytime there's flooding, anytime trash goes through the waterways or any of that kind of stuff, it ends up down in this area called the hole. So it's just a deeply impoverished area, and people have kind of built their homes up the side of the hill away from this. But as soon as it floods, that water comes up and floods their home. So we're doing a construction project down there, and we're playing with kids and all that. And I was walking like hand in hand down the sidewalk with this kid. And as I'm walking, my foot stepped down while I'm walking with this kiddo. 
and a couple of sensations hit immediately. The first one is my foot starts to get wet. So I realize as I look down that I have stepped into some kind of sewage type of scenario in the middle of the sidewalk, and that is now flowing over my foot. I also realize that as my leg has gone down into this hole, I have scraped the scab that I have forming from my stupid softball injuries. And so at this point, I'm freaking out. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm in a developing nation. I'm going to lose my leg. Like, you know, it's going to get infected and everything is going to be horrible. Well, we, we get it all cleaned up. We come home from that. And a couple weeks later, we take some junior high kids to a week at church camp. I know what you're thinking, but wait, there's more, right? The story hasn't ended yet. So we take these kids to junior high camp and we had um, brought in for the week as part of our rec time activities, we had brought in paintball. So this group comes in, and, you know, we've got the inflatable structures that we're shooting around, and it was very cathartic. Let me tell you, after the junior high kids have kept you up all week long and all of that, it was just really helpful to get to shoot them with paintballs every afternoon. So we're playing paintball one day, and uh, I lean around a structure, kind of kneel down, and I lean around the structure, and I'm shooting at a bunch of kids as they run, and one kid shoots a paintball at me. And here's the deal. I am six feet, five inches tall. Right? There is a lot of me that you could hit with a paintball. But what do you think is the one spot on my entire body that I got hit with a paintball that day? Yes. So the paintball hits me in my leg that is trying to heal after the third time that it's been injured. And I won't go into all the details for those of us who don't appreciate these stories. But the combination of blood and pus and paint from the paintball, it was like a unicorn bullet had gone off on my leg. Just all the colors that was, it was you know, if it hadn't hurt so bad, it would have been really pretty. But as I stand here today, I tell you this, it is nothing short of a miracle that I still have two functioning legs at this point. I mean, if I had worn shorts today, you can see I still have a huge scar from that whole summer of stupidity. Now, let me shift gears for a second. We're going to be in John chapter 1 today. So if you've got a Bible with you or a device that you uh, use for your Bible, flip over to John chapter 1. That is the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And while you're flipping there, you might think, why in the world is he telling us this disgusting story about uh, his own injuries over the course of that summer? Because in the midst of all of eternity, the God of the universe chose one moment in human history to come down in the flesh and live among us, to be born, to live, to cry, to be injured, to grow, and eventually to die. Okay, all the experiences that you have endured over the course of your life, uh, puberty and growing pains and heartache, Jesus experienced all of those things just like you and me. He took on flesh, the same kind of flesh that would be susceptible to sports injuries and poor decisions and anything else. Why? To give us hope in what is to come. We have hope because God came to us. We have hope because God came to us. So let's take a look together at John 1 today and a few other scriptures and see what that means for our everyday lives. So John chapter 1 verse 14 starts this way. John says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Now, the word here, when John uses that, the word means Jesus, okay? Word, it's where we get logic, logos. Um, it means that Jesus himself came to be among us. He became flesh. We call this moment in history the incarnation, okay? It's the incarnation. And that word might look familiar to you if you took, you know, a couple years of high school Spanish or you like to go eat at Mexican restaurants. You might recognize a little part of that word if you've ordered carne asada or anything like that. Okay, that comes from the same word. That, that, is, that means meat in Spanish, right? The flesh of an animal. Jesus took on flesh and came to be one of us, to share in our experiences, to sympathize with us, to bring us into relationship with himself. He came to be among us. And this word picture, when it says he took on human flesh and made his dwelling, it's basically the idea of God uh, setting up a tent and being uh, in our presence. And I have to confess to you, okay, flesh is one of those words I really don't enjoy. It's, it's kind of ironic that I have to use it like 50 times today because I really don't like it. It's kind of like some of you have a tick with the word moist, right? Does anybody hate the word moist? Like when I say the word moist, it's just disgusting to you and you think, oh gosh, I wish he would stop saying the word moist because I think the word moist is so gross, right? That's how I feel with the word flesh. I do not enjoy hearing that word said out loud. 
But it's actually one of the harshest words that John could use to describe body when he writes this book. He does it to get our attention. Because everything that we've experienced in our flesh, Jesus has too. I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't play on his local church softball team. But if he had, okay, his, his flesh could have been torn in the same way because he was just like us. Well, verse 15 goes on. It says, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, I know this gets a little confusing, all right? So we'll take a quick time out. We've got a couple of Johns here, and I know that is just hard sometimes for us to track with. The John who writes the book of John, the gospel of John, is one of the apostles. That's the apostle John who was with Jesus in his ministry. And he, when he refers to himself in this, does it very, very humbly. He only ever calls himself the disciple Jesus loved. Okay, he does it basically just so he never records his own name so that, so that Jesus' name is made great by the book he writes, not his own. Okay, so that's the John who wrote it. The John he's speaking about here is John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who started an earthly ministry before Jesus and who paved the way for Jesus' ministry. But in the first century world, there's kind of status attached to the first person to begin a ministry. And so what John the Baptist is reminding us of is that, yes, his ministry began first, but Jesus was around uh, for far longer than he was. Well, verse 16, out of the fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in his closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. We can know God through a relationship with Jesus. Now this year as a church, uh, we have been working through a devotional resource together called Core 52. And I encourage you, if you haven't picked this up yet, please stop by the Connection Center in the Commons after service and grab a copy of this book. We would love for you to have a copy. We've been talking about uh, text from the Bible and our messages together. And then during the week, you can read a devotional uh, resource about that very thing that we talk about. And what I think Mark Moore does a great job of in what you're going to read this week is giving us some implications of this idea of the incarnation, that God came to be among us in human flesh. What does that mean for our lives? Okay, and the first implication of the incarnation is that God is near. Okay, God is near to us. Philippians 4 says it this way. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We should experience some peace in our hearts and minds knowing that God is near. Now, does that mean that we're never going to struggle with anxiety? We're never going to feel down? We're never going to feel stressed? We're never going to feel overwhelmed? Of course it doesn't mean that. What it means is that our relationship with God should give us some peace in the midst of the challenges of our existence. Romans 8 reminds us this way. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I will be totally honest with you. I have, over the course of my life, struggled sometimes with this idea of just the relational nearness of God, of, of that being able to cry out to God as Abba, Father. I grew up in a fairly legalistic church background. Maybe some of you are the same way. My understanding of God as a kid was that God was kind of this distant judge who if I stepped too far out of line, he was ready to smite me. Okay, I was in deep trouble if I made too many mistakes and made him mad. You know, we talk a lot these days about cancel culture and all the things we're frustrated with that we see out in the world. But, but I'll be honest, those of us who grew up as kids, church kids, Christian kids in the 80s and 90s, man, we wrote the book on cancel culture, right? Like, I distinctly remember not being able to read Harry Potter for a time because they were scared we were going to turn into witches and wizards, right? And I remember a time where the big thing was to boycott Disney because of their red shirts or their parades or whatever else. I remember there was a time where Christians didn't buy anything from Procter & Gamble because we had been told some crazy story about how they donated money to the Church of Satan or something. You know, it was before Google, so we couldn't find out that that wasn't even true at all. But the message that somehow I internalized as a kid 
was that there's a whole lot of messiness out in the world, and it was my job to stay clear of it because I didn't want to be guilty by association. I didn't want to take any chance that I would get messy like all those people and that God might be frustrated with me. Well, I have since repented of that kind of thinking and come to appreciate what it means to have this nearness, this relationship with God. Now, I'll tell you, I've been called a lot of names over the course of my life. Okay, most of them very well deserved. But uh, when we ministered in Chicago, there's just a very high view of the clergy in Chicago. So it was very common for someone to call me Pastor Jason. Like even in conversation, they would refer to me as Pastor Jason. Um, and, you know, around here, right, I pretty much just get called that dumb Illini fan, right? That's what most people just refer to me as. Uh, when I go to one of our girls' schools, I get called Mr. Weatherholt the whole time, which is about the only environment I get called that. Uh, Elizabeth, I mean, obviously, Elizabeth only ever refers to me as her darling gorgeous hunk, right? That's just the only thing. It gets a little, it's a lot of syllables for her to get out every day. But no, I'm just kidding. I won't repeat all the things Elizabeth calls me. But anyway, <clears throat> and there are only two humans on the entire face of the planet who can call me dad. Now, if I came home today from church and our girls who are 16 and 14 called me Jason, I'm, I'm not going to punish them. I'm not mad at them for using my real name in addressing me. But there are almost 8 billion people on this planet, and only two of those nearly 8 billion people can call me dad. They have that kind of relational connection to use that title. So why wouldn't they? And we have the privilege of referring to God as our Abba Father because of the relationship that he wants to have with us. We have hope because God came to us. Well, the next implication of the incarnation is that God is love. But here's my question. Would anyone know that God is love by spending just five minutes in your presence? I mean, if someone who knew absolutely nothing about you whatsoever just spent five minutes around you, would their natural conclusion be that a relationship with the God of the universe has changed your entire life? Would it? Well, 1 John 4 says this, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. We talk a lot about love these days, don't we? You know, that anybody who uh, is single wants to have a significant other. Anybody with a significant other wants to be married. Anybody who's married wants to have kids. Anybody who uh, has any of that going on wants to post lovey-dovey stuff about it on social media. And we use the word love for everything, right? I mean, I love the Big Ten Tournament champion fighting Illini, right? Just like all of you do, I'm sure. No, I'm just kidding. I love golf. And I love my wife and kids. And I love photography. And I love coffee. And I love our dog. And I love Matt Giebler. But I do not care for all of those things in the exact same way, do I? No. Okay, and if I'm being completely transparent and honest with you, my love is conditional. And it varies over time. I have, at times in my life, loved things or people, and seen those feelings change over the course of the rest of my life. Thankfully, we worship a God who is not like me. We worship a God whose love for us is unconditional and knows no bounds. Romans 5, 8 tells us this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God showed his love by showing up. We have hope because God came to us. And finally, the last implication is that God suffered. And if we're being honest with each other here today, right, we've, we've suffered this year, right? Lots of us have really experienced some significant challenges over the course of the last year. Even in my own life, I have, I have employed friends who have lost jobs or income. I have friends who are single around the country who have experienced just a depth of loneliness and isolation that they never had before this year. I've had some married friends who found out that the issues in their marriage were a whole lot more significant than they thought when they were stuck together for a period of time. 
I've seen mental health issues just exacerbated by a pandemic. I've, I've prayed and prayed and prayed for friends who were gravely sick from a virus. And some people that I love dearly have buried people they love dearly in this season. And I don't know about you, I never ever thought for an instant that I worshiped at the feet of status quo or security or, or, um, or things continuing on the way that they always have been until some of those things were threatened this year. And I learned a lot about myself by some of my initial thoughts in the midst of the season we've been in. But however you have suffered, whether COVID-related or not, we have a God who understands and resonates. Hebrews 4 says this, Therefore, since we have a high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The God of the universe sent his son to this earth. That son lived among us without sinning, without deserving death, but he took on death that we deserved for us. We have hope because God came to us. So the question is, what is that Jesus among us? What is that incarnation? What is that God showing up? What does that look like for you? Have you felt hopeless lately? And if things felt insurmountable in your own life, where do you need to remind yourself that God is near, that God is love, that God himself suffered? Or maybe you're doing okay, but you've got some, someone in your life who is not doing well right now. Where do you have the ability to speak life-giving words to them, to remind them that God is near, God is love, and God suffered. Our challenge for you this week, sometime in the next six days, is to tell one person why you have hope. Just look for an opportunity sometime in the next six days to tell someone why you have hope in your life. I'm going to close with this. It's fun sometimes to take a step back and see the way God works in situations. So uh, we were not actually supposed to be here uh, this Sunday and last Sunday. Uh, our 20th anniversary uh, was in August, and we were scheduled to go on a cruise with several friends, and we were really looking forward to that. And of course, COVID changed all of that. So we were supposed to be gone. So long before I knew that that would get canceled, long before I knew that, um, that I would get to fill in for Matt this week in our service, we slated this song to end this week. And these words that we are about to sing, uh, I think are just so applicable to where we are right now. It says this, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. And during this next song, God's tugging at your heart. If you're feeling like there is just a lot going on and I would like to talk to somebody, there'll be some folks in the back who would love to connect with you. Or if you're joining us online, or even right now you're still just processing uh, how you are feeling about all this, you can go to greenwoodchristian.com slash next steps and just fill out a form and somebody will connect with you this week. We have hope because God came to us. Let's pray. God, thank you for your son. God, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our anxieties and our worries, God, help us to rest in that hope that we have because you came to this earth to be among us. God, we love you. May this community that we have in this place be a source of hope in our lives. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.